I'm going to talk to you about the operations carried out on board the Celtic Voyager and the Celtic Explorer this year. We did uh, 74 uh, Celtic Voyager days. We used the Celtic Explorer for the first time on inframar mapping since 2007, and we did nine days. We had six survey legs, and we covered nearly 12,000 survey land kilometers. We mapped an area greater than the size of County Clare, um, about uh, 3,800 square kilometers. We visited 150 ground truthing grab stations, collected 10 viber cores, uh, we mapped 22 wrecks, and we operated in depths varying from 23 to 214 meters this year. So where did we work? Uh, we had three areas. We focused on the Celtic Sea, expanding the coverage we had um, inshore previously done. So each of these colors represents a different survey leg. Uh, we also did some mapping off the Mayo Coast at the Atlantic Marine Energy Test Site. We expanded some of the survey work that was previously done up there. And then the Celtic Explorer came in and she mapped way off down south in the Celtic Sea, this area on the UK-Irish border. So just to give you some examples of, of data collected this year, this again is from uh, the, the Mayo site. So the colors represent depths, okay, the, the blue here, deeper out here, it's about uh, 120 meters. So we had a, a lot of bedrock here, we, which is heavily faulted and fractured. These outcrops are up to 30 meters off the seabed. Uh, one of the interesting things we found is for multi-beam mapping, you need very good control on your sound velocity. We were encountering water properties very different along these fault lines here, which was throwing our, our data off or, or skewing our data because the sound velocity properties of, of this water was very different from the surrounding seabed. Um, we mapped what are interpreted as glacial moraines uh, off here. These haven't been mapped before. Um, so we're, we're continually uh, exploring the seabed in, in new areas, okay? This then is the same area, this is the backscatter, uh, so a measure of the roughness and the hardness of the seabed. We have uh, a software problem, uh, which we encountered this year. We're getting some jumps in our backscatter, which shouldn't be there. We're not sure what, why this is happening. There seems to be a correlation between either water depth and or uh, seabed character when you go from a soft area to a hard area. The good news is this can be corrected for, um, and, and it has been in places. Uh, we're working with the software companies to figure out why this is happening. Um, so just to show you on this, by the way, this area here of, of light color, it's fine grained sediments, sand, and then you've uh, bedrock uh, or glacial till here. The reason for this completely different change, and it's very hard to show on this scale, We've gone from one pulse type to another, which we need to do to get uh, to cover large swaths in the, in, in the very deep uh, waters. Okay, we need to go into an FM pulse, which does give you a different seabed characterization. So this is a data example of the Cork coast. Again, glacial moraines here. The relief here is about 30 meters between the, the ridge crest here and these mud patches. Um, more examples of, of moraines along here, okay? Uh, these mud patches are found the whole ways up along the Celtic Sea coast, and they tend to be orientated northwest, southeast, along fault zones. Then the, the Celtic Explorer mapped uh, far offshore, down, down here in the Celtic Sea. Uh, the guys came across these large scale features, okay? These, these ridges orientated northeast, southwest. There's another one here. Um, these were up to seven kilometers wide. Uh, we've got a very big vertical exaggeration on this image, but the relief here is about 60 meters from, from here to here. And these are interpreted as uh, glacial features, okay? Uh, left behind with the melting of the ice sheets. Uh, they have these uh, ribs transverse to them that are uh, tens of meters uh, high as well. 
These have been found in UK waters along here previously. Very little is known about their extent in Irish waters. So we're just starting to encounter these now. And they've already shown us that the, where we've mapped them, we've extended where we thought the ice sheet previously lay the Irish and uh, British ice sheet. This uh, data example, and it doesn't come out great here on, on the screen, sorry, but uh, it's off the South Wexford coast. So the Wexford coast um, has two particular characteristics. It's got an abundance of mobile sediment, and it's got relatively strong tidal currents. When you put the two of those together, you get sediment waves. And this is amongst the most dynamic, or if not the most dynamic, coastline and seabed that we have off Wexford. It needs to be continually monitored. These sands are shifting all the time. Uh, these crests here are up to 25 meters high, um, just 25 meters relief along those crests. So they're absolutely huge structures. Uh, this is an example of, of a 10 meter high uh, sediment wave on the single beam sounder. It's slightly asymmetric in shape, owing to one stronger tide direction than the other. So shipwrecks, um, I already mentioned that we mapped 22 shipwrecks this year. I'm going to just show you examples of two. This shipwreck was mapped off the Mayo coast. Uh, the interesting thing about mapping up there is you're off the shipping lanes, so what you discover up there is probably unknown. Uh, this was uncharted. Uh, it was, we found two, rec two wrecks off Mayo. This, this was one of them, the other was uh, uncharted as well. This is 153 meters in length. Granted, it looks like it's broken in two, um, so this section may be offset. Either way, this wreck is in the order of 120 meters or more in length and it was unknown about previously. This is off the, the south coast, it's 96 meters in length. These aren't the coolest images we, we mapped of, of wrecks during the year. I could just have shown you one of the U-boat off Wexford that we mapped, but that was known about. I wanted to show these because we don't know what these wrecks are. We, we don't know what they are. This is uh, just a cross section of water column data log with, with the multi-beam microsounder. <coughs> This shows us the uh, any masts or rigging or the superstructure of, of the wreck. This is what a magnetic anomaly looks like over a wreck. When we go over most of these wrecks, we're always told in magnetometer, if, if the, the wrecks are made of steel, they will give us a magnetic anomaly. Interestingly, one of the wrecks found off Mayo had no magnetic signature, and it was 64 meters in length. So I'd be very interested to find out what that is. It, it hints that it might be a much older wreck indeed. We also did uh, ground truthing this year. We, took, we visited 150 stations here. The, the guys on this survey lake were hampered by weather, unfortunately. And um, yeah, so I want to say thanks. We, by the way, we had four students over from uh, the College of Charleston, South Carolina, and we're. Uh, mentoring them a little bit with their with their projects, uh, they came out in two survey legs. I don't have pictures of everyone who helped, but thanks to all of the AMS team, um, those who were offshore during the year, and those who helped us with office logistics and port call logistics. Also, thanks to P&O um, for crewing the vessels. Uh, thanks to RV Ops for all the help during the year, and thanks to our colleagues in the Geological Survey who contributed in particular to the ground truthing survey with the site selection and also they, they sent out some staff on that. So thank you. Sean's going to go through the intro. Um, Twenty sixteen, uh, yeah, the first ten years of the op of the uh, Informar program we, we had a dedicated twenty six priority bays. And those were completed last year. Um, Surveying inshore is uh, is quite a challenge. You know, it's, it's quite a dangerous environment. We can only work in daylight hours, so it's, it's quite a, a logistical problem. Um, and yeah, it, it's kind of tough. We don't have accommodation for everybody on the boats and that sort of thing. So everybody's got to really muck in. And between the staff from the Marine Institute and the Geological Survey and, and the contractors that we have, I think uh, yeah, hats off to you all. You did a really great job. 
Um, the, pro the problem with uh, the intro survey and the 26 bays having been done is that we've kind of used up a lot of our bases, and from now on it's going to be in more remote areas. So we're kind of attacking it more on a, on a regional basis as opposed to bay by bay. So you can see here the, the strip along the, the east coast, there's Dublin up there, heading out to uh, Cobalt Point, uh, based out of uh, in, in Wicklow and, and down in Arklow for quite a long time. And if you look at the, the amount of area that's actually covered, that's six months work and if it was in deeper water, the Voyager could do it in about two weeks. So you can see in, in the sort of the, the pinky background there, that is uh, Voyager data that's been covered in the last uh, 10 years. But obviously they can't get in very close to the banks and that, and that's where those small boats get in. And you know, you're working right in, uh, right into the coast here. Uh, we have set up uh, land survey equipment for the, the GPS accuracy. And you can see here that you know, we pick up really good detail right into the coast. And it's one of those things, where should we stop? But in my personal opinion is we need to push it in as close as we can because it is probably the last chance you're going to get to these places. So the Arklow Bank has been quite a challenge. It's very strong currents there. Another interesting thing about this area is very little tidal range, so it's very hard to get in uh, to shallow water. Uh, you know, in, in many places at higher range, you can go in a high tide and then go to deep water, low tide. But here we've been sort of limited to uh, working really hard on springs and then going inshore uh, during leaps. But you can see, I mean, uh, most fishermen will tell you they won't go near the Arco Bank. And most of it is actually restricted because of the wind farm. And it's been really good that the collaboration with the wind farm uh, managers and their vessels, uh, we've had really good interaction with them. And not to uh, forget the RMLI as well, the guys there have been really um, helpful in, in telling us local knowledge and communicating on the radios and telling us where they're. If, if the riptides are really strong, they can throw fairly high and, and dangerous waves. So I think there's a, you just see there a little red circle. This is a, a wreck which all the historians in our club have been looking for for years. Everybody thinks that there's a First World War submarine out there that knocked a shell into the explosive factory during the First World War. And there was a diver that put his finger on a map just as he was dying you know, on his deathbed and said that's what it was. So we all got really excited and thought that, that could be it. And we organized divers to go and have a look. They're going down possibly tomorrow. But this is like a the general uh, grid of data of the wreck. Uh, the lads then took the 2040, narrowed the beams in, and uh, put it on, I think, on tracking mode and shortened the pulse length. And then this is the image uh, that they came up with. Now, it doesn't really look like a submarine. There are some submarines that do have a kind of a, a foredeck like that. You can see the, the screw there. There's an engine block, and the, the, even the prop shaft has come through there. I'll just blast through a couple of images of it. See the engine block there. That's the bow, and that's the only thing that makes you think that maybe it's not a submarine. When you start looking here, and is that a, a torpedo tube? I know for sure that this shape here is consistent with some of the, the First World War subs. I'm just not sure about this bow here. Uh, I haven't seen any photographs that actually show the bow of the <coughs> subs that sort of fall there. And that's just a, a close up of the, the propeller area. And just an overview. For a merchant vessel, this is quite a, quite a very narrow vessel. So again, the possibility of the sun is still there. <coughs> so again, I just mentioned the, the wind farm. You can see we're getting really close there. There's only a couple of meters of water around these uh, the towers out there. And so the wind cat guy has been really cooperative in telling us when it was good to go out and, and when to stay in the shore. You can just see there, this is flat calm water. And there, as it goes over the bank, all this water is moving at about four and a half knots. The boats are crabbing really sideways along the edges here. So it's a very challenging environment to get in close, and, and it can be quite dangerous. And if you, 
I'm not, there was a video I was going to show, but you can see the geo working just really close in along there, and she actually disappears half the time. <laughs> that, that's a video, but I'm not going to go through it. And just some other things, just working with locals, Turles, is the yard there, they just built a new ferry for the Rattlin Island Ferry, and they got a, a big crawler crane in there, and the boat was too heavy to pick up, so they got this big barge over from Liverpool, but you can see here there's a big sandbar at the entrance there. So we were able to feed this day into the master of the barge on the, on the way across from, from Liverpool. So they actually came in and made sure they came in on that side of the bank. And there's just some other data examples put here of uh, British Bay. You can see the purple area is starting to get into under, under a meter of water. Um, and then the Codling Bank is also another dynamic, challenging area. And that's just a uh, South Grey Head there, and you can see we get on, on land in some places here, according to the chart. But obviously, I mean, that's right up against the cliff. And similarly in Wicklow Head. And then just finally, I mean, there is that little gap that we're trying to get, and um, this is. Another way of doing it using you know, uh, drone photogrammetry. But I'm going to leave that for Roman who's coming up the side. Thank you.